season's greetings, everyone. Today is Thursday, December 10th, and you are watching Mediavine's Teal Talk, the show all about the business of content creation. I'm your host, Jenny Guy, Director of Marketing. Happy to welcome you to our last show of 2020. As hard to believe as that is, it is here. The finish line for this dumpster fire year is in sight. Um, in fact, earlier uh, this week, our lead launch engineer, Trista, was asking for um, streaming recommendations. And um, <laughs> I was concurring with our co-founder, Amber Bracegirdle. She recommended Upload. Has anyone watched Upload? Have you guys watched Upload? It's, it's hilarious. It's very cute. Um, it's not suitable for work, but it's a great show. Anyway, um, I said, yeah, it was so great. I loved watching that last year. Um, nope. It was released in May of 2020. And I definitely 100% thought it was in the holidays last year. I have vivid memories of watching it last Christmas. And I sure didn't because this year has been the longest year of all time. And if that doesn't really say everything that needs to be said about this year, I don't know what does. So anyone else? Hi, guys. Thank you for coming. So Let's get down a little bit to business. I wanted to say that while we have very well covered the fact that it's been an insane year and we have weathered all of these different pivots and changes and um, unprecedented things together, um, that is not to say that this year didn't have some really wonderful bright spots, which I would love to hear about from you guys in the audience and also from my guests today. In a minute, I'll ask them, but everyone in the audience, that's saying hi, tell us about some unexpected joy that you experienced in this crazy, crazy, crazy year. I would just love to hear a good thing. It can be about your business. It can be about your family. It can be about whatever. Just tell us a good thing that came out of this crazy, crazy 2020 that we've had. And speaking of unexpected joy and bright spots, it's time to say hello to my guests who are not only my teammates, they are also my friends, doll. <laughs> They're here to talk about all things influencer marketing and sponsored work and get us set up for awesome earnings in 2021. Hi, ladies. Will you say hi? Um, and I'm gonna introduce you guys. And first, actually, before we go into the intros, tell me an unexpected or wonderful thing that happened this year. Josh, is, Josh just said shorts and t-shirts in December. I'm here for that. That's great. <laughs> I'm here for that. Okay, Steffi, something unexpected and wonderful in 2020. Uh, I became a mom this year. So that was fantastic. That's exciting. That's, a, that's an amazing, that's amazing, fun. wonderful thing. And it's a bright spot for all of us yeah. on the team. Danielle, what about you? I think my highlight is I got to join the Mediavine family in January of 2020, like before everything went crazy. And it's definitely been a very bright spot for me throughout this whole year. So and bright spot for all <laughs> that was also um, coincidentally um, before uh, upload came out, regardless of where <laughs> I think it did or didn't. Uh, it True. Did <laughs> after that, uh, we're getting so many things. Um, great comments from people that are talking about the great things that happened. I'm going to read the bios of my guests, although it's a little it's, it's always a little strange when I have um, great friends on here because I'm, <laughs> I know who they are. You, you guys should know, too. Steffi Pretmore loves bringing brands and influencers together in her role as Director of Influencer Marketing at Mediavine. With a background as both a blogger and brand representative, she understands both sides of the brand blogger equation and is passionate about getting brands the custom content they need in a way that values the work of influencers. Outside of work, she is passionate about advocating for better adoption education and loves to rescue all the animals and bake all the things. And then Daniel Spiesman Owens brings 10 plus years experience in creative integrated marketing and sales strategy to her role as influencer marketing associate with a focus on lifestyle brands and digital publishers. Her strong background in custom content creation and ideation, as well as influencer marketing strategies, allows her to develop impactful campaigns for brands, connecting advertisers with the authentic and influential voices their target customers trust. Our bloggers, that's you. Outside of work, you can find Danielle performing live music, enjoying gardening, cooking, all things essential oils, and yoga. So they're both just some pretty badass ladies that are here. Let's talk a little bit about, we always do, we always start in this way. Guys, if you have questions for Steffi, Danielle, me, pop them in the comments. We will get to them, but we're going to talk all things influencer marketing and sponsored work and get us started in 2021 on the right foot. So what is influencer marketing? Let's go with that from the beginning in general, and then what is it at Mediavine specifically? And Steffi, will you talk about that? 
Yeah, influencer marketing, uh, when you're just really drilling down, is using the trusted voices of bloggers, influencers, um, you know, social media personalities, so to say, um, to promote brands and products to their audiences. So you guys as bloggers have established trusted um, rapport with your readers. They trust your voices. They trust um, the recommendations that you're making. And so when you say, hey, I really love this brand, they're like, okay, well, I'll go buy that product. Um, and that is influencer marketing at its most simple. Um, and brands figured this out. And so they use this to, as part of their actual um, marketing strategy now. They are adding influencer marketing um, budget lines to their annual marketing budgets um, to pair alongside the display advertising that they're doing and you know all of the other marketing that they are doing for their brands. There are many, many brands are now recognizing that using the trusted voices of influencers can really come to their advantage. Um, at Mediavine, so I came on the team in mid 2017 um, and was really a one woman show for a little while there um, and have, you know, grown the team. There's three of us on the marketing team now. So there's triple what there used to be. Um, and we really view influencer marketing a little differently than a lot of other influencer marketing, like firms or agencies. Um, I come from as my, as my, um, Bio said I come from a PR agency background where I, where I was running our influencer programs and I talked to some different services at that time. And the thing that I was really struggling with them um, that made me not feel like they were a great recommendation for what we were doing um, was that many of them were very like, oh, we can find you the right people and we'll, you know, our algorithm will find you the right people. Um, and everything was very like algorithm based. And I, because I am a blogger, um, I have had a food blog for a long time now. Um, I also understand that numbers don't tell the whole story and that you can have all of the right numbers on paper, um, but all of the wrong engagement or content quality or just the wrong type of content for a specific initiative. And so, um, that's something that we, what we really focus on here is custom curating everything that we do. We're very hands-on. We really want to make sure that we're pairing the right influencers with the right brands um, and the right brands with the right influencers. So that, you know, if we're reaching out and saying, hey, we think you're a good fit for something, there's a 95% chance um, that you're going to say like, yes, this is a great fit. Um, so that's really how we view influencer marketing here. Um, and I think that brands really appreciate it. Um, and of course, you know, for uh, from a brand perspective, we're handling a lot of like the management and all of the nitty gritty stuff. Um, and then from a blogger perspective, we're handling, again, a lot of the management and nitty gritty stuff. So like all of the nitty gritty comes to us and then we make sure that the people, it gets disseminated to the right people um, and try to streamline that process so that the brands can focus on doing all of the other things that are on their to-do lists and then be able to say like, hey, here's this report and these beautiful deliverables. And on the blogger side, that the bloggers can say, you know, really focus on their creative process, the fun stuff. And yes, and for those of you just joining us, we are here with Steffi Predmore and Danielle Spiesman Owens. They are the influencer marketing, part of the influencer marketing department for Mediavine. We are talking about the state of influencer marketing right now, what it is and where we're going to see it going in the coming year um, and beyond. And and I wanted to ask quickly, this isn't wasn't on our prep doc, but what do you guys love about influencer marketing? What is the what do you think the strength of influencer marketing is um, over any other form of marketing? I'll start with Danielle on that one. Yeah, sure. I think I mean, I kind of double down on what Steffi said. I think now more than ever, we're all home, we're all online even more than we were before. Um, and we want to follow people that make us feel good, that have similar interests. And so it's building this whole other kind of trust with 
a brand or a recommendation than just seeing a display ad or other types of marketing. So I think that it's just kind of, and that's something we really convey to brands. There's some brands that have done this before and others that are kind of testing the waters and it's kind of a new world for them, but really explaining to them that, you know, people like to buy and make purchases based on people like them and people that are using the products that they like to use. So I think that's what makes it unique. Um, and whether it's on your blog or across your social, it's just a whole new avenue to kind of build some brand loyalty, but also using your own true voice and your own you know, side of things. So I think it makes it a little bit uniquely different. And I just want to add like what Steffi was saying. I mean, I've worked with other companies before and kind of in that early pitch phase, um, whether it's an algorithm or we just say, oh, you'll get eight aligned bloggers, you know, and here are a couple examples. But one thing I think that brands really love about coming to us is we take that deep dive and we find not just a food blogger, but someone who has the right voice and someone who's the right fit for them. So when we're putting some options in front of them, um, these are the actual people they might work with versus keeping it so high level just to check the box and get a deal done. So we're really all about the brand side being happy, but I would say versus it being like just sponsored work, it's really a partnership between the brand and a blogger. Um, building that relationship between the two of them helps strengthen that relationship with them and their audience. Excellent. Yeah, we're very Question protective. We're very protective of our publishers. And so if we have brands that come to us and they want something sketch out your, uh, nope. You know, that's not something that we're willing to sacrifice. It's not something we're willing to compromise on um, just to get the work. Um, so we're very, very protective of what we bring and of the, of the work that we're bringing to our publishers and making sure that you guys are, are protected along the way. And that's so important to have. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about using voice the voice of the influencer in, in the sponsored campaigns. But let's talk a little bit about how influencer marketing works at Mediavine and how does a Mediavine publisher get uh, considered for a campaign? And Danielle, what specifically for the, for the blogger makes this experience different than if they were to work with, say, you know, an, a different type of agency or on their own? Sure. So I think there's a couple things. Um, when a brand comes to us or an agency comes to us and they're representing a brand, um, we really take the time to learn about them. So we usually have a discovery call, learn about what is the product or what is their objective? What are they trying to achieve? What are they, who are they trying to reach? Um, you know, what is the time frame? And maybe we give recommendations on when things might perform the best. Um, and then we kind of take a step back. And like I said, we do a deep dive into, we have this vast community of awesome bloggers and pulling together you know, a very curated list for each potential campaign. Um, so they're not, you know, we're not just pulling the same voices all the time or, you know, the same people with the same reach all the time. We really try to customize it each and every time. Um, and we come back to the brand and we say, like, this is their their average reach. This is how they look on social. Um, and who are you most interested? Who kind of, you know, seems like it's a good fit for you. Um, kind of going back to using those words about a partnership. It's, you know, we're protecting our Mediavine bloggers and publishers because we want you guys to have sustainable businesses. And then this is also an investment from the brand side. They want to make sure that their marketing dollars are being invested in a good space. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit different than what they're used to, you know, just a traditional ad placement or a click through. It's more of an awareness play. It's more of building that relationship, like I said. Um, so then from there, they will let us know, okay, out of this list, this is kind of who, who catches our eye. And then we go to you and we ask you guys, are you interested in working with this brand? Um, and if you are, can you give us an idea of how would you write about it? How would you integrate it into your blog? So it feels truly authentic. And then we kind of finalize who we're going to use um, with the brand after that point. So it's a little bit, you know, it's a little more hands on. But I think that in the end, you see better performance and it just feels all in all more authentic um, and not so much like an advertorial or just a review. It's something that will hopefully continue to raise good awareness for them with time. Um, that's kind of high level, kind of how we craft our packages together. Um, we'll probably get into a little bit more of like, 
how you can, you know, be more considered or be more seen um, for those opportunities. But, you know, we have our awesome dashboard and great questions that people can, you know, provide us with information about yourselves and about your blog. So when we're pulling those lists together, it just helps us kind of filter through and see, you know, who's the right fit for those different brands. And we have so many verticals that we cover, um, obviously food, but parenting and travel and finance and pets. So, you know, we really run the gamut there. <laughs> so it, it's all about really that partnership and finding the right, the right fit on both ends. So the brand has a successful campaign, but that you're also feeling good about the content that you're writing and hopefully driving more traffic to your site. And it's a win-win all around. Fantastic. Love that. And love um, recognizing the differences and some of the things that um, you think potentially might be detrimental to you in terms of being considered by a brand can sometimes be your biggest strengths. Um, Steph, will you will you give a little insight on the different things that you are looking at when you're when you're isolating who would be good fits for what campaign? You guys have and we both have talked about this routinely when we've talked about it outside, like it's not just numbers, it's so many different things. Right. Yeah. You know, you're looking at um, what type of content are they doing? And that, you know, like Danielle said, it's not just like, sometimes we get very broad um, products or brands that can apply to a lot of different types of people. But, you know, if it's a, um, like a gourmet food product, then we want to be looking at the types of recipes and um, that 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 publisher is creating. Are they more on the like gourmet food side um, versus a product that is more of a like maybe a little bit more processed or is more for like quick and easy meals? Um, if it's a travel product, is it something that is more geared toward like luxury travel and um, you know, staying in really shishi hotels and things like that? Or is it more geared towards like your really outdoorsy um, type of traveler that is, you know, camping and traveling in RVs and getting out and hiking and that kind of thing. Um, so we're looking at all of, you know, what the fit within your content, we're looking at um, engagement, we're looking at, um, you know, it'll, a lot of times it'll depend on the exact ask from a brand. If they want videos, then we'll take a look and see, like, do you do a lot of video content? If maybe they only want Instagram content, we may just be really focusing on your Instagram. Um, and do you do a lot of Instagram stories? Do you do a lot of like Instagram live or reels or things like that? Um, versus maybe you have more of a Facebook following or there's, it comes down to, you know, you're really your entire brand and everything that you're doing. Um, and so it's very much not just here's my, you know, blog readership and that's it. Um, you know, we, we also want to see, you know, if it's again, like, is it a product that, that has where their ideal customer has a little bit higher household income? Um, we might want to look for readers that focus there. If it's a product that's focused towards moms, you know, all those sorts of things. There's a whole, real holistic view that we have to take of the people that we're we're looking for. Because ultimately, we're wanting to produce results for both sides of the equation. We're wanting to get an amazing piece of content or series of content that the audience will love for the publisher, but also that the brand will like it's, it is lots of different things. Um, I've dipped my toe in this water and there are many things that go into this. They do an amazing job. So let's zoom out a little bit. Let's talk specifically about the state of influencer marketing during, and I'm going to say it again, this unprecedented year. We've all said it. Steve actually wrote in a blog post, one of our co-founders, was it the most unprecedented of all precedents or something? It was great. It was a great thing. I just butchered it. But what changes do we see on deck for 2021? How do we see this moving forward, moving out of this of this difficult period and moving into hopefully a better period? And I'll start with Danielle on that one. Sure. Um, I think, well, when 2020 first started, I think there was a lot of um, campaigns on the books and ideas on how things were going to run like normal. And 
just like we've all had to shift things in our lives, so did advertisers. So things that were centered around typical like seasonal celebrations, oh, that message didn't really work anymore. Um, travel, we noticed, you know, things had to shift from maybe being more domestic or more focused on um, road trips and things like that. So I think, I think hopefully going into 2021, we're kind of used to that conversation a little bit more now. So it's not so much of brands not knowing what to talk about or how to say it or how to shift it. Um, but I think it's just being, you know, conscious of our current climate and this crazy time that we're in, it's probably going to go on for a little bit longer. And I think this last Q4 was really interesting just because things like Black Friday looked really different this year. Um, it was an election year. There was, you know, changes with like Amazon Prime Day and Cyber Monday. So spending habits have been completely different. So I think it's, definitely impacted kind of the direction that brands have wanted to go as far as how they spend their ad dollars and how they're um, structuring campaigns. But I do think that um, more and more brands are switching, you know, their ad dollars from offline to online. And so I could see influencer marketing and those budgets definitely growing going into next year. Um, we're already seeing it more conversations going into the year than we have in previous years. So I think that that is a great thing that we're in the digital space and that this is the world we're all already a part of because um, and we, we do it well, you know, going back to kind of how Mediavine is different. I think that brands can go to different networks and they have just like lists of, my, you know, different sizes of influencers with X amount of followers on Instagram. But when they come here, we can really explain that you're in a brand safe environment that we, you know, know that the traffic on these sites is organic. It's not bought traffic that our, our publishers are doing this to have their own sustainable business. And so they care about the content they're creating um, and give them a little bit of that security that it's a good investment on their end. So I think it's not all bad news going into next year. Cause I think that it could be really strong for influencer marketing as a whole. I think we've been saying for for so long now since all this started that that the, the strengths that influencers have in this environment have been pretty much unpar unparalleled. Nobody else can pivot as quickly as influencers can. These huge giant <laughs> ships that have to change their course are on a different level whereas influencers boom, they can pivot on their own and and make their content relevant to the moment as opposed to we're now seeing some of the like traditional forms of entertainment being able to pick back up a little, but not entirely. They're still in a different environment, whereas the influencer can continue creating that content, not without challenges. I'm not saying that. Um, a specific challenge that I wanted to talk about was the phasing out of third party cookies, which is on the minds of a lot of people that are associated with Mediavine. And how is that going to impact influencer marketing, if at all, Steffi? I mean, the, the punchline is that it doesn't, right? because we've never depended on that. We, you know, when bloggers are creating their content, they're creating their content and there it is. And we're not relying on third party cookies to be able to deliver these targeted ads and yada, 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 um, because it's already targeted based on the audience of the readers, right? They're, we're already kind of sifting through and doing that. Um, so it doesn't affect influencer marketing, uh, which means that influencer marketing may become or can become a different kind of option for advertisers, for brands, um, as they're looking to figure out how they can best target people um, when, the, when targeting with third party cookies is not an option. And there are a lot of ways that we're working to pivot here at, at Mediavine to make things uh, work for us with programmatic advertising. And there's amazing things on the horizon in that way. But this is another revenue stream, which we're going to talk about um, as a great option, which is we are constantly preaching this. You guys have heard me say it a zillion times if you watch the show, which is diversify your revenue streams. Do not just count on one specific thing. And influencer marketing can be such an incredible revenue stream for content creators. But I'd like to hear more about what brands are looking for from influencers. And how can our publishers right now make themselves more attractive to brands overall? And while you guys are answering that question, I'm going to ask the audience a question. Do you guys have any dream brands that you're wanting to work with? Um, coming into 2021 are there any are there any brands that are on your we've talked about it here before the hot shit list um that you are 
super interested in getting and making a connection with. And let's see about the answers from Danielle and Steffi on um, figuring out how they can maybe catch the eye of those brands. Danielle, let's start with you here. Yeah, um, I think there's a few things. I think obviously we have a lot of bloggers here that have really niche categories. So like we said, it's not just, maybe you're not just a food blogger, but you write specifically about vegan recipes or keto recipes or, um, you know, like Steffi mentioned travel bloggers, you've got that really focused type of travel that you do. That definitely helps a brand quickly identify if they're a fit or not. Um, but I do think we also have a lot of awesome publishers here that are, you know, lifestyle bloggers that cover a lot of different verticals. So just making sure that you have kind of a clear point of view, who your voice is, whether that's in your about me section, or certainly in your dashboard, if you cover multiple verticals, make sure it's noted there so that we can find you and say, oh, they don't just write about travel. They write about traveling with their pets and they write about, you know, food on the go. And we can integrate brands organically into your content um, while still, you know, reaching your audience in a way that feels true and not like out of the ordinary. So I think it's, um, I think it's having that kind of clear point of view of who you are as a blogger and that'll help not only us connect with like, okay, this is a good brand for you, but then when the brand is going to your site and going, okay, they recommended this person, why? They don't see a disconnect. It makes clear sense why they wanna go with you. Um, I think that's one of the, the core ways you can stand out. Love Steffi, that. would you add something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think st figuring out your voice, staying true to that, like I think that there are, I think there are definitely ways where, you know, sometimes if you have this dream brand that you want to work with that maybe isn't necessarily like an obvious fit, um, there are ways that you can make that work. But I think that like changing everything about who you are just to get a piece of work um, is, is people can sniff that out. Like they got some good like bullshit sniffers. Like they, they can sniff that out and readers can sniff it out. Right. Um, readers are the first to call you on it. Um, so staying true to your voice, not compromising who you are. Um, and then, you know, when I was, when I was working on the brand side of things, I would also look at how much branded work are they doing? Um, like, are they working with like a few brands, um, and in a very authentic way, or is every single post that I see on that homepage or those first couple pages is every single post sponsored. Because at that point, when you start to see so much sponsored content, then you start to wonder like how much of that is really like impacting the reader and how, how watered down does that message get? Um, so I think, you know, being a little bit picky and choosy about who you work with, because again, it coming from, I am highly susceptible to influencer content. Um, I, I mean, yes, I do work in this space. It's my job, but also I think that's just me. Um, so like Same. I also am highly susceptible to the targeted like Facebook ads. Um, I buy a lot of products from the Facebook ads and from influencer recommendations. Um, but if I see that someone is just like, here's a product, here's a product, here's a product, here's a product. I start to question, like, can I really trust a recommendation versus someone that recommends something like once a month, a couple times a month. And like, I'm like, oh, okay. They don't recommend things very often. So when they do, I really feel like I can trust what they're saying. Like those are the types of things that brands notice. Cause remember, I talk about this a lot. Like remember that brand reps are people too. They also use the internet. And I also think, like, remember that you are a person who uses the internet. Um, yep. So, <laughs> like, think about how you use the internet. And I explain this to brands all the time when they're like, how can I know if someone purchased something right then? And I'm like, well, let's think about how you use the internet. Like, do you purchase something right away anytime you see it? Or does it sometimes get stuck in your brain and three months later you need that thing and you remember and then you go buy it? So, you know, think about how you use the internet, how you as a user like to have things recommended to you and then translate that into the work that you're doing with brands. All very helpful. And then Mia said, I'm gonna pop her comment on here, but it said she she thinks the same thing when she says, 
sees people as so many sponsor posts, especially if they were all over the place and what they're writing about. Right. Um, thank you for that comment, Mia. I was going to say, I, I don't know what you guys feel about this, but I've been seeing this a lot more lately on Instagram because um, I've been stopped. I've stopped being an Instagram and I've started spending time there um, and I love it now, but I, I've been seeing people do things like, especially in their stories, this is not sponsored, but I just really love X. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's another really great way to build that trust level. Mm -hmm. And then especially if you're wanting to form a long term relationship with a specific brand, but just being real genuine and saying, I don't I'm not getting anything for this. I just really love this. And I'm just telling you, like in my life being real with you. Yeah. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think that that can absolutely work. I mean, so yes, I have a blog, but I might I don't blog very much anymore. Um, and my Instagram is very different from my food blog now. Um, but and I'll share a lot of things. But like I have shared my hot my husband has a hot sauce sort of turned into an accidental collection. Y'all he has fifth, over 50 different types of hot sauce, not bottles of hot sauce, types of hot sauce in our house. And it's wild. And so every so often I'll give like an update on the collection um, for new Instagram followers on my stories. And I'll like tag his favorite brands. I'll be like, this is not sponsored, but these are his favorite brands. And I've had them reach out and be like, Hey, we would love to send you. We'd like, we'd love to work with you, send you stuff. Um, like we'd love to send him a hot sauce care package. And so you can, you can get the attention of brands that way just by sharing what you genuinely love without any intention of like trying to get something free out of it um but then also i can't tell you how many of my friends have messaged me later and been like i went and i bought that hot sauce because alex loves it so much so you know like it all works and it's a great way like let's say i did want to pursue working with that hot sauce brand like i could be keeping track of like how many messages I got that said, Hey, I went and I bought this because of your recommendation. Like those are all things you could take to a brand and then say, Hey, I shouted you out. It was a super quick shout out on my stories. This was the, this was the result. Like I know my readers would love to hear more about this and they would respond well to it. If you wanted to have a formal partnership together. And also because we genuinely like this, this isn't something mm -hmm. we're having to make. And it's, and that's not to say that you can't, create a, a beautiful organic story that comes from when you start a relationship in a different way. That's right. just saying that there are different ways of starting out this relationship. Absolutely. Um, here's, here's something that I want to hear from both of you on that Michelle Price actually just asked a question on. I'm going to, I'm going to pop it on the screen. She says, I say that all the time because I know so many who don't disclose anything and it's a major pet peeve of mine. So I want to be clear that there's no need to disclose anything and quote, I forgot to do it. Yes. Steffi has a lot of feelings about this. We'll start there. I have a lot of feelings about this, you guys. You've got to disclose. You've got to disclose. If a brand is coming to you, okay. The FTC is very clear about this. They're yes. very clear about this. We're in 2020. This is not 2011 when I started blogging and nobody really knew what they were doing and what is influencer marketing and oh my God, I can get paid for things or- Give me a just, blogger. Like I'm literally, blogger. I remember the first time someone offered to send me like a bottle, like a jar of coconut oil. And I like lost my mind that someone wanted to send me a product. Yes. I was like, oh my God, this is insane. So like we've come a long way y'all. And there is like, there's a resource on the FTC site um, the for our team that is pulling links. Um, there should be a link to it in the FTC disclosure blog post that I wrote on the Mediavine site. And it like, it takes the language and it just breaks it down very easy to understand. Um, so there is, I'm, I'm going to be real straight. There's absolutely no reason in 20 heading into 2021 to not be disclosing your work anymore. That means you need to disclose if a brand gave you something, whether it was monetary or whether it was product and you like you got, you have to, you've got to. Um, and it needs to be up front. It needs to be the first thing that you see. It needs to be really obvious. Okay. Um, it does not, that doesn't mean like, and the, they're, you know, they, they talk about like, it doesn't need to be like hashtag this. Um, but you can, you can say it in plain language. Like they sent me this. Like I, you know, I received this from them. I, this, you know, this is a sponsored partnership with blah, 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 like a paid partnership with blah, blah, blah. 
um, there's different ways to say it, but it needs to be upfront. It needs to be obvious. You got to do it. You just have to do it. And if you're working with a brand and they come to you and you know, you're reading their contract or they come to you in an email and they're asking you either not to disclose, um, they're asking you for do follow links, which is a whole different topic. Um, but also important, um, or they're asking you to like hide your disclosure at the end of a post or in different comments like walk away if like you need to let them know that that's not okay that you will not do that and if they won't back down you need to walk away because you could irreparably damage your brand and your business by not properly disclosing there's my that's my soapbox and it's a red flag for brands that are doing things the right way. Like, and that's, I want to get into that in a second. I like Mia, Mia just said, I like to say, quote, in return for my very opinionated opinion. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask both of you for this, because while I said there are some things that you can do to get on a brand's great side or to position yourself well, one of our favorite emojis on the, the brand team um, is this one. And I want to know what is the one, what are some of your like, eh, when you see somebody doing something on a site, um, a, a blogger doing things or not doing things that make you go, why are you making this so hard? Uh, let's start with Danielle. Are there a couple there that you can toss, toss out? I mean, there's one that seems kind of silly, but it's probably a big uh, for me um, is when you have a great blog site and you have really great social content and I cannot find your social buttons anywhere. Um, if I am trying to pull a list of potential mm. publishers for a brand, I go to your site, I take a look, like we said, at your content, and then I go to each one of your social platforms and see is it a fit there and what that engagement looks like. If I have to Google your social handle to be able to take a look, it's taking me way too long to do that. And I guarantee you that brand is not going to take the time to do that. And that will get you on the naughty list. That'll get you off of being chosen really quickly. So it just seems, um, you know, if you, if you don't have a big engaged Twitter, that makes sense. But highlight the ones that you're spending your time creating content for that you already have followers and audiences coming to um, because it just will make it easier all around, whether you're going brand direct and they're looking at your site or if it's someone that we're pulling as a potential. Um, I think that's definitely just a big one that we're constantly pulling our hair out when we see a really great site that's a great fit and it's just missing that. Um, that's probably one of my biggest. <laughs> Where do we want to put it? I would say, I mean, for me, it's easy when it's at the top, um, mm -hmm. easy to find. Sometimes I like it when it's, you know, you've got your little bio and then they're right underneath that. I know some people kind of put them at the very bottom, but sometimes that's a long way to scroll. So, I mean, it's not, a, it's not yeah. hard as long as I can find it, but I would say, you know, just making it easy. So you're not having to click to a contact page. And then sometimes I see it written out, like, is in a word form with a link, but I had to have read your whole bio to even get that that mm -hmm. far. So um, just saving that time, I think can bring you higher up on the, the options. So yeah, I agree with that. My, my top two are in the, like in the, in your header or in at the top of your sidebar. Um, so very similar to what Danielle said, and this comes more from when I was working on, on the brand side, um, because we have access to some different things here um, without having to like do a ton of searching. Um, but when I was on a brand, working on the brand side, I need an email address. I need to know how to get a hold of you. <laughs> and I can't tell you how often I would be like on a website and I would be like, oh my God, this person is perfect. I love them so much. I'm looking at their social and I'm like, oh my gosh, they'd be such a great fit. I would love to work with them. And then I couldn't find an email address. Didn't, I would look all over the website, couldn't find an email address. And I would have to be like, because contact forms break. They are, I think we all know this by now. Contact forms like are notorious for breaking. Like if you want to have a contact form on your website, that's fine. I personally hate them. Um, so I am very, I am not very likely to reach out unless I just absolutely have absolutely nope. no other option. And it's like the last, it's the last possible thing. Um, and yes, yeah, some brands may reach out via social media, but the other thing to note um, 
is that the the folks that are doing influencer marketing may not be the same folks that are running the brand social media. Um, so if it's a firm, they may be different firms, even if it's internal and maybe different teams. So reaching out via social media may or may not work because like you may see somebody that comes through from like an agency's handle and you're like, I don't know who that is versus if I come, you know, straight to you from, you know, General Mills or something. Um, like it just, it's a, it's a very hit or miss there. So just please give us an email address. If you want to like write it up, you know, so that it's like Steffi Predmore. At That's fine. Email. Dot, like if you want to write it out so that the bots don't pick it up and you don't get like spammy emails, then I don't care as long as I can find it. Uh, yes, I used to be a brand before I came to Media Vine, and I would literally sit in my office and be like Marco, and I would scroll for like like a time where I'd be like Marco, and if I was scrolling around long enough, I'm like and bye, and I would close it because that was the end because I yeah. can't, I don't have time to sit there and play Marco time. Polo on your website, like I just don't. <laughs> and how am I gonna go sell this to one of my higher up people if I can't even find it myself? Like that's not gonna yeah. work. And if you're trying to tell yeah. a brand like. Brand, do you want to work with this person? I know you can't find their Instagram, but it's awesome once you get there. Like that's not a sell. Which spend maybe seven years looking for it. It's great. Yeah, you're gonna. On, it's guys. gonna be worth the journey. So yeah, make it easy. Make it really, really easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mia just said, "Help me help you, Jerry from Jerry McGuire," and she nailed it. That's how we all feel when we're sitting there. We're like, "Help me, help me, mm -hmm. help you." Like that's the thing we want to, and we can't, when we can't find your stuff, it's terrible. Is there anything yeah. else that makes you go, eh, Steffi or Danielle, either one of you? There are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of totally valid reasons why you might be delayed in responding to emails. Like we're, we're people, we understand. And, and that is something that, you know, I think we always try to advocate for our publishers. If you are working on a contract, you know, you're under contract and you've got deliverables. And I had a, co I had a phone conversation with a publisher not too long ago where she had, we had drafts due and she called me up and she was having some health stuff going on. And she was like, I think I just, I need like two extra days. And I said, absolutely. I will take care of it. I talked to the brand. I said, she needs two extra days. Can you look at all this other stuff first? Come to hers last. It was no problem at all. Like we totally get that. Um, but when you just sort of ghost and then we're having to chase you for every single thing um, and email you multiple times to get every single thing out of you. Um, even if your work is beautiful, it really makes it hard for us to say like just with full gung ho gumption, go back to and say that we think a brand should work with you in the future because it's, it was so hard to get, the deliverables like get from point a to point b um so you know if you're gonna be out of the office you so you're you guys are running businesses right um so you know if you're working with a brand and you don't get email responses like that's really frustrating so it's the same on on our side so you know use your out of office response on your email like if you're going on vacation and you're not going to be able to respond or you're going to be delayed i don't mind getting out of office responses at least i know oh they're going to be a little bit delayed so you know or this is why or you know whatever it is if you're on maternity leave or um you know just taking the month off like whatever it is um you know put that in a put that in so that we know instead of just being like is anyone out there oh Hello. Hello. Yep. Always. Please. So yeah, I oh, think, Daniel, please. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to reiterate because from the brand side of things there, the stuff is time sensitive. Mm -hmm. So we're really mindful that, you know, you guys have your own editorial calendars and like Steffi said, you're, you're human mm -hmm. content creators. It's not just like, Oh, we can go on the back end and just slate something to run on certain dates. But once a brand is excited and interested in partnering with you, and then we reach out and say, this brand is excited. You said you're excited in influencer work. And then we don't hear anything. And then we have to send another one and another one. That like, you know, excitement starts to fade pretty quick. And mm -hmm. then we kind of have to go back to the drawing board and say, oh, like we thought these were a great fit for you, but now we have some other options. And so they start to lose that confidence also. So if you really are excited and wanting to do influencer marketing, 
you know, just be mindful of let us know. And if it's not a fit for you, that's okay. Like we are all about protecting you and making sure that it's a brand that you want to write about and you want to endorse, but don't leave us hanging, please. Just let us know either way. <laughs> Very much so. Okay. Let's, let's, um, let's get into something a little bit uh, controversial that I know is something that we yell all the time, but let's talk about contracts and scope of work. Why is it so very important to have a contract and read it every single time you do work with the brand? What should be included? What items are negotiable? And I'm going to say this with the caveat that no one here is providing legal advice. None of us are lawyers. We're just talking about this from being brands, working with influencers, being influencers ourselves. Please, Ste Steffi, talk about it. Yeah, contracts are really important um, because brands will. I, I, the, my my best example of the thing that I see brands trying to sneak in most often, um, and the thing that like just really riles me up, is if I'm working with if you're working with an agency instead of the brand directly, they will try to add a clause so that your payment is dependent on them being paid by the client and they're basically the clause is like we won't pay you until the client pays us well if that client default never pays them that means you're never getting paid um so that is something that does not fly with me um so that's something to look for it's stuff like that you're protecting yourself by reading that contract um, that doesn't mean that you have to be necessarily the one to read it. Y you may have a lawyer that you hire and you send all of your contracts through to your lawyer and you say, can you please take a look at this? Um, remember that things are negotiable, not just the scope of work, but actually the, the bulk of the contract itself. So looking at those payment terms, uh, making sure that they're not sneaking in any weirdo exclusivity rights that, you know, would mean that you can't work with a like brand for two years and you didn't realize it. And now, you know, you didn't charge enough for that. Um, really taking a look at the usage rights of, you know, how do they want to use your content, making sure that you're not accidentally giving them the rights to use your content and repurpose it however they want in perpetuity without being paid properly for that. Um, there's, there's, those are some of the most common areas where I see kind of sketchy stuff trying to be stuck in there. And, and they may or may not be doing it on purpose to be sketchy. Um, sometimes they don't really realize what they're asking for. So, you know, don't necessarily, you know, go back to them like, just like on fire like oh my god you're the worst like they may just be completely clueless um you may have to do a little education like mm, this is not going to happen this is how much i charge for this you know whatever um but we're just remember that all of those things are things that you can talk through you can you can negotiate any area of that contract um and you know obviously i think the thing that people focus on the most is the scope of work, which is actually outlining, you know, what those deliverables are, when they're going to be delivered, you know, what they have to include and all of that. But don't forget that bulk of the contract um, and just taking a glance through that and making sure that you're not signing away way more than what you're getting paid for. Another big one that we've had, we've seen several times is brands are wanting publishers to turn the ads off on a sponsored mm -hmm. post. And mm -hmm. so if that's happening, see how long they're asking for that right. and make sure you're being compensated for the loss in revenue that you're going to experience yep. if you turn your ads off on the post. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, if you're negotiating that, try to set a limit on that. So it's like 30 days or something like that. Um, but absolutely. These are all things that you want to think about. Um, in terms of the rate that you're charging and being really clear um, that, you know, I am charging this rate and this is what this includes. And this is all extra, extra stuff. And if you want that, I'm happy to, to price it out. I'm happy to negotiate what that's going to look like. But if you want to pay this price, then this is what you're going to get. And one of the things that I love that you guys do so well and, and guard rail against, guard dog against is our rewrites and changes because that yeah. can become quicksand um, yeah. easily with the brand. Yeah, make sure that um, if, if you have to do drafts, 
that you have set out what that process looks like, if it's one set of reviews, if it's two sets of reviews, um, and make sure that you are guarded against them changing your actual language. Um, so in the contracts that we do, it's you know listed out that they can change the things that pertain directly to their brand and their product, um, but not the influencer's voice. Um, so that they're not coming in completely rewriting your post and turning it into something that you wouldn't say. Um, so, you know, I mean, there are some reasonable asks, right? Like a, a brand can come in and they can ask you not to use profanity in a post. Like that's not really an unreasonable ask. Um, but for them to come in and to completely rewrite your voice and write it in a way that you do not ever talk again like your readers are going to know that notice that they're gonna be like this does not sound like steppy that's weird um so you know make sh make sure that they're not taking such control that you lose the authenticity and and amazing for protecting yourself but also those posts don't perform as well traditionally they right posts where they, they because that's not why why would you do influencer marketing if you just want somebody mm -hmm. use talking points that's another works yep. yeah i think it goes back to like you guys were saying earlier about talking about things you like to use whether it's a sponsored campaign or not truthfully the sponsored work shouldn't sound completely different i mean it should be clearly disclosed that this is sponsored but you should be talking about it just like you would anything else so it performs the same and it still feels like an authentic piece of content and not some advertorial you know i think and that'll help one thing that we try to convey to brands is that you know you could have sponsored work done let's say you do a holiday recipe this year well next year when people are searching for those relevant recipes you could get that awareness and that peak all over again so i think that it's just making sure that it's always written in your own voice but obviously highlighting the key messaging and the things that the brands want integrated um i remember before I was working with like bloggers, when they first started coming out, I was pitching more like editorial pieces. And we would always have brands that would want to know how many product integrations are guaranteed in this post. And we would have yeah. this like struggle back and forth about, you know, if it feels too forced, it's not gonna really work. And people are gonna know this is a bot like advertorial. So I don't think, you know, it changes that much once we're starting to use, you know, your voices instead, but just keeping it like, you know, keeping it so it, it'll sound like you, whether somebody reads that it's a, you know, it, it's a sponsored post or not. We're not, we're not going for infomercials. Like we don't want Ron Popeil. Right. Like that doesn't need to happen <laughs> yeah, like, in, in the, in the post. Uh, so let's, we're, we're running a little short on time, but let's talk about actually putting together the content. How can you make content that stands out and, and what, what are brands going to see as going the extra mile for them that, that will make them want to continue working with you? Danielle, will you share a little on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to one thing I said in the beginning is that it's a partnership. So if you want the work, spend a little time on their site or try to understand what the brand is trying to achieve so that you're, you're highlighting those things. Um, you know, if we're working with, a cheese brand and we come to you and say how would you write about it don't just say i'll make a grilled cheese and check the box and will you pay me this money now like think about it this is them choosing to invest their dollars in you to hopefully get some roi to hopefully get some sales to hopefully get some awareness so they want someone who's taking the time to not just say okay they sent me these five bullet points they want included in the post i'm just going to do the bare minimum and get that draft off Think about it like you would if it was a piece of content that you were writing, you know, and like we said, we're all consumers of this type of content. People are coming to your site because this is the environment they already like to go to and they like to read what you're cooking or they like to see where you're traveling. So I think it's it's that same idea of just remembering it is a two way street. And for some brands, this is something they do all the time. But for others, this is a test. This is seeing, you know, is influencer marketing a fit for me? Um, and they're going to feel a lot more comfortable if you actually kind of took that extra time to give it some quality content, you know, whether that's your photographs that you're including. But I would just say in general, just their overall voice. Don't just copy paste. Think about, you know, what is it they're trying to convey? Who are they trying to reach? Are they highlighting, you know, very specific things and bring that to the surface, you know, the best way you can. 
Very helpful. Um, and incorporating, thinking about their goals along yeah. with yours, your voice, their goals, your voice. Love that. Steffi, same question to you. How can you make yourself stand out? And, and maybe even not necessarily during, you know, either when you're writing the content or after the campaign. Um, you know, again, I think this goes back to when you are really timely about responses, uh, responses that you are like really, like we can tell the people that are really, you know, they're taking the timelines and they're, you know, making sure that they have everything written down, that they are, you know, actually using the checklists that we send, that they're, you know, actually going through and reading the scope of work and making sure like they've written the content, everything, like they are going through and they're double checking that they've done everything and included everything. Um, and they're really like taking that time to, to make sure that all their I's are dotted and their T's are crossed. Like you can tell that stuff. Um, and so, you know, I think that again, like we're business people. And so, um, you know, get a planner, get, Asana, get Airtable, like these are all tools that you can get and you can get free versions or paid versions or whatever, like make sure that you are creating a system that works for you so that when you get a contract that comes through, you're putting all the pieces in place so that you, you don't miss a beat along the way. Um, you know, if you've ever worked in an office environment, um, treat this just like that. Like this is this is your job. This is your business. This is this has gone from a hobby to something that is bringing an in income for you, and and treat it that way um, because it, it does make a difference on the brand side of that the experience of working with you um again like without having to chase you down and remind you of things and hearing like oops, oops missed that oops <laughs> uh, you know. i would just want to add really quick it's kind of a mix of an eh again but also if we come to you and we say okay this is the scope of work we're looking for this is kind of what their core objectives are um you know what would you charge how would you write about it don't come back to us with like a whole different scope of work or, you know, what you want to do because we've already kind of done that discovery call with the brand. And so you may have some great ideas and maybe that's something we suggest down the road, but sometimes it's really hard when we're trying to filter through, okay, these are the kind of final publishers to go with, but then you've thrown all these other ideas or these other, other things that they're not really looking for. Or maybe they don't have the budget for right now. So just be mindful of that too, I think will help in your selection process. Yeah, give them, actually the, had a give them the info that they need, you know? Yes. Right. <laughs> Answer, give them what they're asking for. They're paying mm -hmm. for it. So so be considerate of that. Um, quickly, what is the scope of work? Just for in case anyone doesn't know, we, we had our, our co-founder, Amber, ask that. Um, so a scope of work is basically where we detail out what is the job at hand? What are they you expected to do? So um, it's an evergreen blog post with associated social shares on your Facebook, your Instagram, um, as a post, as a story. Like we'll have this very detailed out so that you know what the deliverables are and you know what the client is expected to pay for. So it's basically just a really clear overview of everything that is expected for X amount of dollars that you're going to get paid. So if you do things outside of that, um, you know, that may or may not get Part, you may not get paid for it. Um, or sometimes, you know, like we were talking about contracts earlier, we may have a whole scope of work figured out. And then a brand comes to us and says, hey, can we have rights to use this on our site? And then we go back and we say, well, you might be able to, but we're going to ask them because we have to update the scope of work and the contract and probably how much they're going to charge. So it's just a kind of a way of detailing out exactly what those deliverables are that they're expecting. Fantastic answer. Okay, we are about out of time, but we have, um, I actually would like, we have a couple of people saying they don't feel qualified to pitch. And I feel, I want, we've shared a lot of blog posts in here that I think will help you be qualified to pitch and feel qualified to pitch um, and, and feel proud about the work that you're doing. But the last question I wanted to ask both of you and just to think about what is one thing that everyone right now, any blogger, publisher, content creator can do to set themselves up for success with sponsored content work and working with brands in 2021. And I'm going to get that from you in one second. Guys, this was our last episode of 2020. Thank you so much for being here with us. Our next Teal Talk is January 7th, 2021. We've got Siobhan Sudbury of the Be Free Project. We are talking new 
new year, new you, get unstuck in 2021 for the business and life that you are meant to have. We are so excited about that. Please subscribe to the Mediavine YouTube channel. Uh, we put all of these episodes up once they're edited and they're a great place to catch up. We have all of our conference sessions. We, when we used to have those, we will again someday, maybe um, like our Facebook page and bookmark Mediavine on air, which is our landing page for all Mediavine productions. So you can stay uh, up to date with the latest and greatest. And finally, uh, before we go, uh, Danielle, please, what's one thing that everyone could work on or do right now to put themselves in a great place for 2021? Um, okay, really quick, I would say, if you're here right now and you're listening, you qualify to pitch yourself. So have confidence in yourself because you're already doing a lot of the right things for brands to feel comfortable you know, going with you. Um, and I would just say, you know, be mindful of the climate we're going into next year. If you always wrote content a certain way, you might have to shift that voice a little bit to be a little bit more relevant to brands. But brands are looking for influencer marketing. They are looking for these environments to be reaching new target audiences. So just, you know, don't be afraid to shift a little bit, but, you know, well, staying true to yourself. I'll Great. Thank Stephanie. you so much. Yeah, sure. Steffi, same to you. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I already kind of touched on it, but I think set yourself up with some systems. Um, I love the system, you guys. I'm, I'm an Enneagram one, so I love me a system. But use those systems. We've got not, you know, not just keeping track of like contracts and things like that, but set yourself up with something to keep track of brands you want to pitch. Who have you pitched? Did you follow up? Um, what was their response? What was their email address? Um, keeping track of, you know, using some of the things like the RPM challenge, um, you know, keep track of those, those, those are things where you can see like a difference in performance on your posts um, when, you know, not just in terms of how much money you're making, but, you know, a lot of times you can see a difference in the performance in your top posts just from Google or whatever. If you're doing SEO optimization, um, you know, kind of keep, keep track of some things because there are absolutely stats and things that you can pull from that to talk to, you know, use as talking points when you're talking to brands. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can kind of make easier on yourself so that every single time you're pitching at someone, you're not having to like go back and start over um, so that, you know, you've got a little bit of a, of a flow going. We love a good flow and we're going to flow right into 2021. You guys, happy holidays, whatever you celebrate, however you celebrate, be safe. We are so grateful for you. Have a wonderful uh, holiday season and we will see you in 2021. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>